Linda Gordon, who was Dorothea Lange? Dorothea Lange was a very important photographer in the period of the Depression, the 1940s, the 1950s. Many people don't know her name, but I can guarantee you that everyone in this country knows her photographs. One of her photographs, which is often called Migrant Mother, has been called the most famous photograph in America. It's sort of the Michael Jordan of photographs. It's used in every textbook. When, when I ask my students, what is the visual image you have of the Great Depression of the 1930s, they describe this photograph. Where was that photograph taken? It was actually taken in California. And it's interesting because she was really the main California in the Western US during the 1930s depression. And it was taken among people working in a pea picking field. These were migrant farm workers who moved along from uh, field to field from one uh, agricultural uh, operation to another, picking as the crops ripen, ripened. But this particular woman had been, and her family and many others were stuck because there had been an unseasonal freeze and there was no work. The pea crop was destroyed and uh, they were sitting there with no work and uh, hoping that they would find work at their next stop. What year was that photograph taken? That photograph was taken in 1936. And it somehow it just spoke to so many Americans. It was published first in a local newspaper. And in fact, it was very functional because so many people were affected by it that they sent many contributions, just private, spontaneous charity to the pea pickers who were stuck in the fields. Has that woman ever been identified? Yes, she has. Her name is Florence Thompson. Many years later, in the 1950s, she came out, so to speak, as an American Indian, uh, claiming to have been a full-blooded Cherokee. At the time, in the 1930s, she did not have that identity, and Dorothy Lange did not know it. And it's a very interesting question, because everyone assumed she was a quote-unquote white woman. And I often wondered how people would have responded had they thought of her as an Indian. You write in your book, Dorothea Lang, A Life Beyond Limits, that the story I tell is limited, not only by my areas of my expertise, but also by the available source material. Lang did not document her own life. She was really not a woman who ever expected to be famous. And it was only really toward the end of her life. Uh, she died in 1965 at age 70. It was only toward the end of her life that she began to accept herself as an artist. She originally was uh, a studio portrait photographer. She had a thriving, very, very successful business in San Francisco. Um, and then when she began doing what we today called documentary photography, which is not a word that existed at the time, she really didn't think of herself as an artist in any way. She thought she was a craftswoman practicing her craft, and she was an employee of the federal government, getting a very low wage with a small per diem because she had to travel around to where all these camps of farm workers were located. And partly because of that, she didn't have the impulse to save uh, every scrap of paper, the way someone who, uh, you know, who thought of themselves as an artist uh, might have done. Where was she born? She was actually born uh, in the eastern U.S. She was born in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1895. She had a very ordinary middle class childhood until at age seven in 1902 she got polio. Polio was actually a new disease at that time. And she was lucky that it only crippled one of her legs. At that time, there weren't even iron lungs. Had she been, had the polio crept into her torso and her lungs, she would have died. So she was actually very lucky. But she was a disabled woman. And she later would say that this was the most important formative part of her identity, her disability. She was very good at hiding it, though. 
in when she was born, women wore long skirts. Uh, her mother was very afraid that she would be unmarriageable because of this, we think of as a very slight deformity and a limp, and her mother drilled her in hiding it because she wanted her to be a happy woman and have a husband and so on. Um, but she, she really hung around New York City. It was New York City that she was in love with, and she was a self-taught person. She was not, uh, she never went to college. She did not study photography formally. Uh, she got herself jobs at assistants at portrait studios and sort of taught herself to photograph. How'd she make it to the West Coast? With a girlfriend uh, in 1918, uh, when she was 23 years old, they decided they wanted to go around the world. They were gonna have an adventure. First they took a train, then they took a ship through the, um, the Gulf of Mexico, arriving in San Francisco, and as luck would have it, the moment they arrived, the very day they arrived, they were pickpocketed and all of their money was taken. And if it hadn't been for that, they probably would have gone on. But because of that, they stayed. And she stayed forever in San Francisco or Berkeley in, in the Bay Area. Very enterprising, got herself a job right away. First went to stay at the YWCA until she could get some money together. And within a couple of years, she had a, a thriving photographic studio. Linda Gordon, when did she start with the federal government and in what capacity? A series of wonderful for her accidents. Um, she, her photographic studio was right in what was then downtown San Francisco. And as she would take photographs, and her clientele were very wealthy people, but she would look out the window and she saw homeless people sleeping on the streets, uh, people begging, soup kitchens. And just for the heck of it, she decided to go out and start doing these photographs. A photographer friend of hers liked them, put up an exhibit of hers in an Oakland, California gallery. And that exhibit was seen by a man who would become her husband, Paul Taylor, a very different kind of guy, very straight, economist, professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He saw these photographs, he thought they were sensational, and he hired her first for a program of the state of California to try to help all of these agricultural migrants. Then, since he was an agricultural economist, he took her photographs to Washington, D.C., to the Department of Agriculture, where they had started a small photographic project. The man who was head of that project took one look at those photographs and hired her on the spot. He'd never seen her. He had really no idea what he could ask her to do, but he thought, this, this photographer has to work for this project. So in 1936, she shifted and began to work for the federal government for a project known as the Farm Security Agency. How long was she with the feds? She worked for them for four very intense years through the fall of 1939. The pro project itself was killed off by Republican Congress people who were very hostile to all of Franklin Roosevelt's uh, enterprises. It was killed off in 1941, 1942. It, funding was taken away. But during those years, she worked like a trooper. She may have been disabled, but she was a very strong woman. She was traveling through the major agricultural valleys of California. This is without air conditioning, where it's 120 degrees in the shade a lot. She was sleeping in cheap motels on her very small $3 a day US government per diem. Um, and she discovered that she was happier than ever doing this work. She liked it so much more. I think her studio portrait photography had begun to seem uh, that it wasn't helping her to grow as a photographer, that it was just more of the same. She was very good at it. And in fact, if you look at that famous painting, Migrant Mother, what you see, and it's true of all her so-called documentary work, uh, 
She was really always a portrait photographer.